Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a transplanetary, Charles Coulomb. Transplanetary? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, I... So let me get... So basically, <laughs> Earth, Mars, Venus... I'm, I'm a citizen of three worlds, is that it? That's right. All hail Barsoom. Barsu? Barsoom. Barsoom. Well, who is Barsoom? Not who, but what? It was the name of the planet Mars, as far as the Martians were concerned, in Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars series. Wow. It had another name for the Martians in Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, but it was called uh, Malacandra in uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. A whole lot of Martians going on. That is true. So you're, th you're saying then that I probably began my, my life, my early days, next to a canal on Mars. Yes. Strumming the stringed instruments that we call... Exactly. I see. All right, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, what can I tell you? You are at least advanced enough to not insist on terrestrial origins for all your employees. Yeah, the fact true. that, what's that? That's right. We're very open-minded and very accepting at Tumblr House. As you should be. As you should be. I think, frankly, speaking as a person who is, oh, how do I put this nicely? Uh, as a person of, shall we say, not entirely earthly origins, I, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. There, see? We, we're totally accepting of aliens. Well, that's good. That's good. I, I'm glad to hear that. Well, now, uh, well, of course, I was interdimensional last week, so I guess it's not just planetary. You'll you'll accept people from other dimensions, elves. Uh, it, 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 it's, as long as they can do the job, you don't care about their, their plane of origin. As long as you can put in a solid 60-hour work week, we're happy. I see. Well... All you unicorns and satyrs and, 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 and elves and dryads and all the rest of you guys out there, know that if all else fails, if you can do the job, there's a place for you at Tumblr House. That's right. <laughs> Gosh, you know, the, the, them unicorns don't have to go under uh, anymore. They can, they, they can get work here. It's what I've always said. This is a meritocracy. You put in good work, you will be rewarded. So it doesn't matter if you're a Martian or a Vulcan or from some as yet undescribed other dimension, the fifth dimension, say, Mr. Mazzillaplek, you're fine. Totally fine. Okay. Well, it's, it's bizarro world is okay. So, uh, but let's... You know, let... I, I could see a commercial... <laughs> Here at Tumblr House, you see this Star Wars cantina-like setup with all these people working. Well, I mean, all these beings of various kinds, happily smiling, set as elves, you know, all this sort of thing. They're all working, mixed in together, happily smiling. At, at Tumblr House, as long as you can pull a 60-hour shift and carry your own weight, we don't care where or what you're from. <laughs> like that? Just like that. You've got, you know, this is Ula. She's from Lost Atlantis. Hello. She slipped through a time warp. And over here. <laughs> this is Grog. We're not sure what he is, Grog. But. <laughs> he does a real good job. Keeping this, keeping this bit of ceiling from falling down, don't you, Grog? Grog. <laughs> and because he lives off plankton, he's really easy to feed. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what's new, Charles? What's going on with you? What is new? Lots of things are new. For one thing, in real time, tomorrow is Mother's Day. Okay. So, if you're one of the fortunate ones who still have your mother with you, oh, way to remind me that I'm an orphan. Thanks. No, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm not, I'm not over it. But seriously, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you still have your mother with you, you'll be sure to uh, embrace her. Mother's Day, you know, has a very strange origin. Hmm. Uh, it was invented after the Civil War by a. A lady who wanted to honor her mother, and she was in West Virginia. There's a church in West Virginia that she belonged to. I forget what it was, but it's a Protestant church. It's Baptist or Methodist or something. And to this day, they call themselves the Mother's Day Church because the lady who started Mother's Day got the idea there. Um, there might even be a couple that dispute the title. But anyhow, Father's Day came later, and the... Uh, it was the same idea. There was this woman who wanted to honor her father, and there was a church service and this and that. So there are one or two different places that claim to be the uh, birthplace of Father's Day as well. But whichever the case, uh, you know, Mother's Day is a, a wonderful day, of course, to honor your mother. Uh, it's interesting that in medieval uh, Europe, the uh, I believe it was the third Sunday in Lent, they call Mothering Sunday. And that was seen as a way to honor not just your mother, but also your your hometown and your parish church, wherever you were baptized. The idea being that those two were your mothers, in a sense. Hmm. So, at any rate, uh, be kind to mom. Also, uh, on the 22nd of this month in the United States is Memorial Day. Hmm. So get ready for that if uh, you know if you're thinking of any any of the honored dead of our wars. Uh, this being the early part of the month of May, there are May crownings in a lot of places. So if you can get in on that, you know it's the month of May. C'est le mois de Marie, c'est le mois le plus beau. It's the month of May. It's the most beautiful month. Hmm. Flowers everywhere. Well, that's all on the good side. No, on the not so good side. As we know, Diana Ross and the Supremes are making a new record. What's it called? Overturn. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Judge Alito's uh, the the Supreme Court office in an unprecedented move, one of their uh, scumbags or scumbagettes uh, released a draft of a uh, majority decision, which may or may not come to pass, in overturning Roe v. Wade. And the result has been electric. All sorts of uh, orify have been yapping uh, in every possible direction in the United States and abroad. Uh, once, uh, firstly, of course, this kind of leak I don't think has ever happened before. And if the Supreme Court have brains, they will root out the source of that leak and squash it. Beyond that, there will be, and I'm sure already are, attempts to uh, abuse the Supremes and uh, uh, overawe them into uh, going the other way. Um there are several things that have to be thought of here. Firstly, one of the reactions has been attacks on Catholic churches across the country. Um, all I can say is that scum have to get scum. You know, if you're going to pull that kind of garbage, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to attack people and if you're going to attack property, you mustn't be surprised if the people and the owners of the property concerned give you your own back. So don't go looking for a fight unless you want one. But remember, the problem with looking for a fight is that you yourself can get hurt. I think I've told the story of the uh, fellow in junior high who attempted to extort money out of me. 
and I uh, I basically paid a, a hitman <laughs> to uh, deal with him. But I'll never forget when the kid was being dragged away, the look on his face, because it suddenly dawned on him that instead of being the one inflicting pain, it was going to be inflicted on him. That realization, uh, it, 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 I, to the end of my days, I'll never forget that face and that look. It had all gone wrong. So beware, ladies and gentlemen, of being abusive when you're riding high. Because it'll come back one day. If not in this life, then the next. Be kind. Don't be abusive. Don't be nasty. Don't attack. Because you may find you've gotten more than you bargained for, as uh, Mr. Putin could tell you. Hmm. Uh, don't open up cans of worms if you're smart. But then, of course, smart is not really a very modern quality, is it? The second thing is that this was only a leak. Now, apart from the hysterical reaction to it, uh, there's no assurance that Roe v. Wade, in fact, is going to be overturned. It's not a done deal until it happens. And what's going to happen when it does happen? Well, I'll tell you what will happen. Uh, women will not be forced to have back alley abortions the way they like to say. What's really going to happen is this. When Roe v. Wade was passed, most states, in most states, as in civilized places throughout the, uh, the world, uh, abortion was illegal. Now, there were several places, including the great state of California, thanks to then Governor Ronald Reagan, uh, where abortion was legal. When Roe v. Wade was passed, what happened was that all of the laws against abortion in the various states were voided. They didn't disappear. They didn't vanish. But they were no longer of effect. They were still on the books, but could no longer be enforced. That's what Roe v. Wade meant. What does overturning Roe v. Wade mean? Well, what it means is that in the states where it was illegal at the time, or it was legal at the time, like California, it will remain legal. In fact, the scumbags and morons in Sacramento have said they'll turn California into a, um, what do you call it? They'll turn it into a um, abortion uh, sanctuary state. And they will pay for ladies in states where it's illegal to come to California and have their abortions. Who's going to pay? Taxpayers? Well, yeah, the state of the state. Well, no, so the state will pay for it. State government will pay for it. Oh, where's the money going to come from? Oh, that. Well, yes, it'll come from the taxpayer because unlike Washington, Sacramento can't just make up money and pretend. So, yeah, that's going to be your money. So, and mine if I move back there. So, um, the uh, that's what the, those people have said. However, in the rest of the country, those states where it was illegal, they were a majority of states in 1972, uh, then it will become a question of the state itself. Now, in states like Mississippi, Oklahoma, Louisiana, etc., uh, they will probably, it'll probably remain illegal. Uh, some states, a few states, maybe five or six, in the interim between 73 and the present, actually did move to change the legislation that was on the books. But a lot have not. And there are states like probably, I'm pulling rabbits out of hats, but Minnesota, Iowa, places like that, that have changed since 72. And in places like that, the state legislatures will probably move immediately to render it illegal. Or sorry, to render it, to legalize it. Uh... And then in between, there'll be states where it becomes a fight. And then that fight will be fought out in the legislature or in a referendum. So that's what it's really going to mean, that uh, abortion will once again be a state measure. Okay. Um, which means, as I say, the fight will become 
political once more and not traditional. Well, that's a step up. Yeah, it's a step up. And I mean, for the pro-abortion people, they should be happy because it'll mean that uh, in those states where they have a majority, they'll be able to say, see, the people want it. And the other thing, too, is that obviously a woman in uh, Texas or Oklahoma who wants an abortion will be able to go to a state where she can get one. All expense paid trip to California anyway. Hmm. Won't that be great? People from Bung Tussle, Kentucky can will be able to fly directly to California and, you know, have an abortion, see Hollywood, check out the beaches. Has the state ever gone bankrupt? Uh, I, uh, during the Depression, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I don't see why they should go bankrupt. They could just raise taxes. I mean... We just raise the state income tax. That's all. You get more money that way. Just milk the cows. You know. What are the cows there for except to be milked? I mean, as the man said on the radio, there's still a lot of money in the state, but so much of it remains in private hands. What a shame. Yeah, it is. You guys are there to be milked. Accept your calling. Well, well did you think you had a, a, some other purpose in life? You live in a free republic, and so you're owned by your masters. Now bark like a dog and sit back while you're milked. Bark like a dog while you're milked? I feel like it's no. like two conflicting animal images. I know. It's called mixed metaphors. Okay. I, I got to mix up a little metaphor here. <laughs> it's kind of like a cocktail bar, you know. Let's, let's see what kind of metaphor we can mix up. You know, you're, you're walking on thin ice. You're skating on eggshells. <laughs> that's that's what I've got to say about the whole uh, Roe v. Wade thing um, and of course it will polarize the country further uh, you know which what the hey alright um, well all that talk of California really put a bad taste in my mouth so let's would you like to go to your happy place? Let's go to our happy place. Let's start the memes of production. Nationalize the memes of production. For the common good. Mm. All right. We have some good memes. We're going to start out with a proper meme. We we haven't had a proper meme. I've just been reading people's comments. We're going to start this, this one out with a proper meme. All right. From Miranda. Thank you, Miranda. So... Uh, everybody knows the, the popular meme, um, you know, the guy from the ancient aliens on history channel says, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was aliens. Right. So I'm glad the history channel gives us solid formation in history. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, the broke version, this guy saying aliens, the bespoke version, Charles saying the fae. Well, that's true. I think elves are a lot more elegant than aliens, don't you? <laughs> I love, I love the congruency that she got here, where your hands are up just like his. So it's like you're saying the same exact same thing, but using different like words. I love that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 frankly, despite being interplanetary this week, uh, I, if I had a choice between being an alien and an elf, I'd go for elf every time. Fair. I'm, I'm into Earth, you know. I'm, I'm not. Uh, mind you, Mars is not a bad place for my memories, but uh, still. <sighs> All right. Uh, so thank you for that, super fan Miranda. Um, let's let's read some comments. Uh, Connor says, uh, "Well, as for the third place question, we talked about the third place last episode. Right. We may definitely need to rekindle it." 
Thankfully, Tumblr House has the 13th place, which never exists and yet perpetually exists. There's that. <laughs> There's that. And if you could retreat to your own 13th place, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have nothing to fear from our masters of the world outside. <laughs> they may have something to fear from you. All right. Uh, a gentleman with the moniker Lhasa7 says, Chow mein sandwich, benign Canuck, uh, what is it, Canuck, Canuck, Slop? Canuck. Or benign Eld Canuck Slop. Or Eldritch Horror. <laughs> benign Canuck Slop. <laughs> Eldritch Horror. <laughs> It's got the sort of tentacle stuff going on. It's got I could see that for sure. I think it's delicious. <laughs> I, I love I love Chow sandwiches. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. You got the crunchy noodles and there it's not just slop. The, the the noodles are very unique, very particular to New Bedford and Fall River. Uh, um, super fan Jeff Finkbonner says, yes, we will commemorate Charles by serving chow mein sandwiches at his funeral, Cincinnati chili at his wake, and peanut butter <laughs> banana and mayo sandwiches at his estate sale, commending him to the triune god with the unholy trinity of cuisine. That way Charles gets less purgatory either way, whether by our fasting or our eating. It'll be a suffering smorgasbord. Redemption rebates, bundle and save. Oh my gosh. <laughs> boil, boil, boil. You know, that guy has outraged New England, the Midwest, and the South all at once. But, uh, at least he didn't, at least he didn't bag on toasted pepperoni. Oh. Toasted, uh, uh, not pepperoni. What am I thinking? Toasted. Uh, oh, raviolis. Yeah, toasted ravioli. Yeah. He didn't bag on those. Well, because they're probably tasty. Everything you mentioned, well, except the banana sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a bit beyond. Poor Susanna. Just, yeah. All right. Um, all right. So we, oh, uh, let's see. An, okay, we'll go into this. We'll go into a question from Philip. Okay. Um, so he actually has a question. He says, I understand that among the recorded last words of Dutch Schultz, you know, the, the famous gangster, uh, yeah. there occurred the phrase French Canadian bean soup. Are these the oh, French Canadian pea soup? Are these the mere ravings of a dying a hood or do they express some higher wisdom? Oh, they definitely <laughs> express higher wisdom. <laughs> definitely express higher wisdom. French Canadian pea soup, ladies and gentlemen, is one of our national dishes. It is so great. It's not that green goo yeah. that goes by the name of pea soup. It's rich and thick with chunks of ham and bacon yeah. and garlic. And it's just, oh gosh, it's good stuff. I mean, I can see how that's um, some you know, higher wisdom. I mean, Dutch salt was an innovator. And it sort well, of, he came up that. with models for persuasive design. He was a deathbed convert. Was he? He was. So in all likelihood, he saw heaven. And of course, what would, what's the first thing you would see in heaven? But French Canadian pea soup. It makes perfect sense to me. All right, we're going to move on to, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to I, Patrick. I, I, thought wanted, I thought you wanted to explore this a little while. <laughs> I suddenly lost a taste for it. Um <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, fine. Be that way. Um. So, I th was it last episode? I think you, we did Idaho. You did Idaho for State of the Week last episode, and, and Charles uh, Patrick says Charles didn't mention the Greater Idaho Movement. What is the Greater Idaho? Do you know that, Charles? Not offhand, actually. I'd have to look it up. Mm. So okay. he didn't mention it because he didn't know. Mm. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned on the pre-show, we have a special submission from Chicago Jacobite who wants to do a lightning round for Charles. All right. So we'll do this, the, this week's state of the state of the week next uh, after the round. Yeah. Okay. We can do that. Sure. Well, um, whichever. Either way. I don't care. Okay. We'll do state of the week next week. Uh, cause we are no, next week. Oh, wait, what? 
No, what, do you what did you state say? Of the week, uh, before or after the lightning round. Oh, okay. We'll do state of the week after the lightning round. All right. All right. So are you ready? I am ready. All right. Here we go. Charles Williams. Amazing. Savannah, Georgia. Lovely. Public education. Disgusting. Myrna Loy. Wonderful. St. Bonaventure. Brilliant. Dibbuck. <laughs> Soros. <laughs> Early television programs. Marvelous. Robert Taft. Brilliant already. So wise. Wise. Okay. Uh, Honky Tonk Music. Great. Robert W. Service. Good Canadian. Pre-Raphaelites. Beautiful. Urban the Second. Misunderstood. Babylon B. <laughs> Excellent. Glenn or Glenda? <laughs> Deep wisdom. <laughs> this was this was too positive of a lightning round. I feel like I, I'm going to do an impromptu lightning round right now with you. Okay. Um, are you ready? Yeah, well, I said disgusting for public education. All right. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> Wicked witch. <laughs> um, George Bush, senior. Loser. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Richard Nixon. <laughs> Crafty loser. Oh. Okay. Um, Chairman Mao. <laughs> Ding dog, the, the boob is dead. <laughs> Burning uh, in hell. Yeah, uh, hell spawn. Neo Pelagianism. <laughs> <laughs> Rampant. <laughs> Utterly rapid. <laughs> They're everywhere. You can't escape them. <laughs> just all over the place. That's They're hiding right. under my bed, even as you speak. <laughs> the Opal Agents. Okay, that's a good one to end on. Uh, Does he have any others? You got tired of him. That was it. No, I, I said all of them. He had 14. We went through them pretty quickly. You're mostly positive right. other than um, public education. Disgusting. Yeah. All right. That was that was fun. Um, all right. Now, state of the week. Um, a request from a humble fan named Pax Europea at Roma Nova. Um, who humbly requested that you do New Hampshire. Ah, uh, New Hampshire. Well, New Hampshire, the White Mountain State, is a wonderful, wonderful place in so many ways. Uh, and only a couple of really inbred areas. Uh, let's start with the coast, which... Uh, I really, I really love. Uh, when I was a little boy, we would summer at Hampton Beach, and what would happen is that my uh, my uh, mother and her two sisters and uh, husbands and children, we'd all take a, uh, we'd rent a house for the summer in Hampton Beach, and uh, it was it was really great memories. Seabrook is nearby. And even before they had the nuclear power plant, Seabrook Village was renowned for inbreeding. It had only three family names. It went back to the colonial days. Watts, Fowler, and Eaton. 
and uh, they had the Brooker look in that section of the town of Seabrook. Then the big town is Portsmouth, which is the biggest city in New Hampshire, big naval base and all that. But colonial roots, it was uh, before the revolution, a town of great refinement and all that. There are remnants of that still. Uh, Governor Wentworth's mansion, uh, that's Benning Wentworth's mansion. Uh, Governor John Wentworth's mansion is now part of an old age home, oddly enough. Um, the uh, Fort Adams, uh, which was formerly, uh, I think, Fort William and Mary or something like that, uh, is there in the harbor, or is it Fort Constitution? I always mix it up with Newport, Rhode Island's fort. Anyway, uh, formerly British, seized during the, during the unpleasantness. Beautiful, beautiful houses in Portsmouth, in colonial Portsmouth. Um, beautiful churches as well. But if you can tear yourself away from Portsmouth, there's a lot more in New Hampshire. Uh, it didn't have the whole Unitarian thing, but every town has a congregational church on the green. Uh, the, uh, you've got the town of Manchester, which is, was heavily French-Canadian and was the headquarters of the late, much-lamented Association Canado American, uh, which I still get my insurance through. Uh, my life insurance, and through the Knights of Columbus. Uh, a lot of French Canadians in New Hampshire, especially in Manchester. Great French Canadian restaurant there, whose name escapes me. Um, you have Nashua, which also had a lot of ethnics, Poles, Italians, and so forth. Uh, we've got a couple of Robert Frost houses in New Hampshire, which makes sense because. His father was a New Hampshire Yankee and his family had been there forever. Winchester, New Hampshire is another source of, uh, well, let's just say Seabrook uh, rumors. It was also the birthplace of Hosea Ballou, the founder of the Universalist Church, which later merged with the Unitarians, become the Unitarian Universalists. Uh, before they merged, the joke as to how you could tell the difference was that the uh, Universalists taught that, uh, the, the Unitarians taught that man was too good to go to hell, and the Universalists that God was too good to send man there. So, uh, the Puritans in New Hampshire were somewhat less puritanical and uh, a bit more fun loving. In Ringe, New Hampshire, is an amazing place called the Cathedral of the Pines, which is a multi-faith, interfaith temple to America and to Americanism. And it's really got to be seen to be believed. Uh, let me see, what else can I tell you? The White Mountains, of course, are a really fascinating place to go. Uh, Oh, and Squam Lake, which is the great wasp resort. The people, uh, Robins and people like that would come up from Boston to go to Squam Lake. Uh, and I would be remiss in not mentioning three centers of education, two important uh, boarding schools in the secondary line, uh, St. Paul's and uh, Essex. Uh, Academy, Phillips Academy, uh, Exeter, sorry, not in Essex, Phillips Exeter. And let me see, what else can I tell you about New Hampshire? No, I think that's, that's uh, pretty much it. It's uh, probably the most conservative of the New England states today. Uh, the Manchester Union, uh, leader, guardian, union leader, whatever it was called, I forget now, my mind's gone, it was a really, for a long time, was a very conservative paper. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people from Massachusetts have moved to New Hampshire to escape Massachusetts taxes and then have set to work trying to remake the, the Granite State in their own image. Oh, that's one thing I should mention. Of course, Yankee Magazine is headquartered there, as is the old Farmer's Almanac. And we can't forget the now departed uh, 
apparent face in the mountains, the old man of the mountains, which about 15 years ago collapsed. But from colonial times, it had been a real feature. Lastly, but not leastly, the state motto, live free or die. So I've had a lot of good times in New Hampshire. I love the state. It also is home to Thomas More College and uh, Magdalene. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention those two places, uh, especially because I know a lot of people there. And St. Benedict Center in Richmond. Let's see anything else I can point out. Ah, that'll do it. Hmm. Why do they call it the Granite State? Uh, because there's so much granite mine there from uh, the White Mountains. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, I don't know about our audience at home, but I I know for me when whenever uh, you're doing State of the Week now, I'm kind of browsing through Google Maps uh, at the places uh, you're talking about. Um, it's really I I feel like because of the States of the Week, which uh, we have been predominantly New England uh, so far. Uh, I yeah. really want to visit New England. I really like that look. It's really sort of. I don't know. It evokes a very different feeling from California, to say the least, you know? You think? You think? Um, and I personally wow. haven't... The closest I've gone to experience that is, uh, I mean, I guess Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and right? Like Allentown, I guess. But still, it's uh, it's still different. Yeah, it's it's they're closer to each other than either are to California. Yeah. But uh, they're very different. Yeah. I... Uh, you know, I, I was born in New York, as you know, but I'll be buried in Fall River, Mass. Mm. So I have a uh, I have a great fondness for New England. Yeah, it really looks wonderful. I like this Lake Winnipesaukee too. It looks like a cool lake. Yeah, a lot of beautiful lakes in New Hampshire. I mean, <laughs> it's it's uh, not too overpopulated by a long shot, and uh, it's it just it's a beautiful state. And of course, like. All New England is neat during the autumn, and mm. not just for leaf peeping. You know, they 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 keep Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, it's a big deal for them there. Mm. Indian pudding and pumpkin pie. Very good. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Time for the questions, Charles. Are you ready for the questions? I are ready. All right, let's do it. Uh, first one is from Jeffrey, who says, Dear Vincent and Charles, thank you again for your interesting and entertaining podcast. You are taking me on a journey of subject matters that I might never have thought to investigate on my own. And perhaps best of all, when this mug of mine is dour and is dying for a reason to smile, you guys make it happen. I cannot express my gratitude enough. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's really sweet of you. It um, is, and, and we, we much appreciate it. You know, these are dark days, dark times for all of us, but on one level, that's part of the human condition in general. Uh, there hasn't been an age where there hasn't been problems. And certainly, just in my own lifetime, although the situation has changed perhaps radically, perhaps two or three times, there were always problems of some kind or another, and it just doesn't do to let yourself be overwhelmed by them. Yeah. But anyhow, go ahead. Okay, so he goes on to his question and says, I'm sure you've touched on this matter in the past, but I was wondering if you might do so again. Is it possible to have a pleasant conversation with anyone anymore? <laughs> why, why does every personal conversation have to somehow involve politics? How does a discussion regarding gardening have anything to do with political matters, yet somehow it always gets to that point. Why does a discussion about praying and seeking God's guidance always need to lead to a discussion of politics? It seems that politics has become people's religion nowadays. I'm not denying the importance of political matters, but man, it's giving me a headache. How does one gently and courteously express to another how to have a proper perspective on politics? I really don't know because it's likely mine is flawed as well. Thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. Well, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? What can I tell you? Uh, I think the best way 
is to be up front. And if the, if the other individual, don't you do it. And if the other individual starts steering the conversation in a political direction, say you're not interested. Be up front. You know, I, I'm, I, we were talking about gardening. I don't care about that political garbage. You know, it just doesn't interest me. That, I mean, if, that's, if you want to avoid a political conversation, just say you're not interested. You know, and if they insist, uh, then you say, well, then can we talk about turtles? I mean, I know you're not interested in them. But what if I insist that we talk about turtles? Hmm. Yeah, I definitely feel you, Jeffrey. Um, I feel like part of, I think part of what I'd like for Charles and I to sort of rub off on people is how to have friendly conversation with people who disagree with you on that's, pretty serious matters. Yeah. Because that's really important because we're losing that because we're seeing it on television and it's sort of, we're getting programmed. Um, and it's, well, and, and on the internet. And on the and, internet. And the thing, the thing is that If you've got any any set of moving parts, if you don't have sufficient oil, sufficient lubrication between them, they grind, they they seize up. Yeah. Uh, I I have a number of friends with whom I disagree on a lot of important issues. Uh, we know where the other stands, and that's it. Yeah. You know, there's no point belaboring belaboring it. If either side insists on belaboring it. And if whatever common interest you had is, is no longer binding you, then that really is the end of the friendship. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've I've had to this the past few, but over the past year, I've withdrawn from several organizations I belong to because of Wokery. I mean, mm. these were organizations devoted to things that. Were by all rights apolitical, yeah. But when they turned political, it was obviously no longer a place for me because it certainly wasn't my kind of politics. And the annoying thing is that, of course, my politics are precisely the politics of those about whom or the organizations were centered or who founded them. Hmm. So. I felt a bit of uh, resentment and usurpation, as you might say. But, you know, that's the call of the current leadership, not mine. And if their their own politics are more important to them than the common interest, that's on them, not me. Hmm. And I and I won't I won't pretend that I see it getting better anytime in the immediate. It will eventually, because people cannot live at a high pitch all the time. No. Even your most tie-dyed, you know, triple nose ringed, face tattooed moron, at some point has to say, okay, I can't live at this level. It's high pitch. Yeah. I can't live in constant outrage. Um, but the stupider one is, the longer it takes for one to realize that. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, um... we tell us, we tell this, um, abortion is infanticide. Those who advocate abortion advocate infanticide. They don't look at it that way, most of them. And it's that realization that they don't look at it that way that allows one to interact with them. Hmm. 
take that realization away. And what are you left with but a bunch of filthy baby murderers? Just as, reversing it, uh, what are they left with, in my case, but someone who uh, wants to force every woman to have a baby she doesn't want and to take over her body? Something she was incapable of doing when she conceived, of course, but never mind. Um, So we go from a basically agreement to disagree, even on something very fundamental, based on the presumption of the other person's ignorance but semi-goodwill, to reducing them to the enemy. Hmm. Yeah. And the problem is both sides can play that game. And if you dehumanize your opponent, you have to presume he'll dehumanize you. Well, also too, I mean, you just use the word opponent. You you can't yep. be an opponent. Like you're you're done if you're an opponent. You're done as okay. soon as soon as they become your opponent. So, your commonality is finished. Yeah. Um. In the words of Saint Francis de Sales, in finding uh, God's will for you, even the greatest gift when given from an enemy will be rejected which yep. is what you're trying to do but um you know in this scenario so uh i kind of wanted to uh because this is really important to me personally um and i feel like a lot of people um could benefit from it because i feel it's so connected to um being more content and happy in life You know, there's so much social isolation with the Internet, and I think people are hungry and starving for more connection, um, which is why the third place interests me and I'm sure interests so many other people. Um, So I kind of wanted to touch on some other things when it comes to conversation and conversation when it comes to, you know, politics or religion or whatever. Uh, One of the things that I think that the Internet um, is hurting people on is it's teaching people that you don't need rapport with someone when discussing subjects. Yeah. It's like, like for example, um, people come on this channel all the time and say, hey, whoa, I've been a longtime fan, Charles, but you really disappointed me on this or something like that. Well, you, sir, you're a stranger on the internet and you have no rapport, so your comment is you're just an anonymous hater on the internet, right? And why is that okay? So too in real life, right? Like you need to build a rapport with someone before you're going to, you have to find what unites you first. You have to build trust. You have to build friendship. You have to prove that you're a nice person, worthy of respect and worthy of being listened to. Now, if you don't establish that, why should I listen to you? And people people just like jump right through it and they want to be heard so badly, but they don't, you know, they're they're jumping the steps and it just doesn't work like that. So it it doesn't. (laughs) And I also find a lot of a, a lot of younger people who have basically grown up with the Internet. I've noticed it's very difficult for them to modulate their voices. And they they are very often kind of monotone. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if that comes of not interacting in person enough. I don't know. But, you know, when you maybe, guys... Maybe Asperger's is the the leading, uh, the real leading uh, plague of our time. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, you know, if you guys want to get to know someone, if you want to enjoy someone, the trick is ask them about them. Are you genuinely interested in them? Um, Go to lines from me for perhaps other workers is just like, what's your top five favorite movies? And I love asking that too because if you think about it, that is a great dice that provides a great dissection of what this person is interested in, what 
speaks to True. them. And once you have that extra information, then you can actually understand them more and you can understand how to communicate with them better, right? It, it's such a powerful social tool to actually listen first th- instead yes, of but it, it, but it deprives me of the chance to show everybody how wonderful I am <laughs> and, so, and how smart I am. That is assertive. <laughs> Because I feel like that's true. <laughs> but I feel like if you look at all the good conversationalists, they're really good listeners. Um, and uh, because they're, it allows them to understand and to interact with people better. Um, and also another rule of socialization is being a chameleon, matching people where they are, because that's going to make people feel comfortable. Um, what did St. Paul say? Of all things to all men. That's interesting. All things to all men. And that didn't mean he was two-faced either. It meant that he adjusted himself to his audience. There you go. There you go. The, uh, you know, and if there's anything we need to breed today, it is geniality. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with being genial. Yeah. Uh, if you're genial, you'll find your surroundings soon become congenial. And, you know, I, I'm very proud of, I feel like, the people who, I mean, our community, honestly, um, because. Which community? Uh, d- d- no, no, uh, excuse me. Uh, I wasn't clear. Um, off the menu. You know, oh, the, the people yes. who enjoy us, the people, all these crazy people, Todd Bird, Jeff Finkbonner, all the patrons, Vonde Radio. Um, New Jersey, uh, Andrew from New Jersey. And, oh, of course. Well, geez, well, that goes without saying. Andrew from New Jersey, the other Andrew from New York, I think. Um, I mean, there, there's so many people. This goes on and on. We, we get um, the gatekeeper to the Paramus Mall. <laughs> of course. Um you know, these are all people, if you want to, the commonalities with all these people, honestly, is the people you want to have a drink with. They're people that yeah. are interesting. They're people that are funny. They're people that are respectful. And I hope that everybody, you know, you should want to be like that, you know? Are there, are there, are there, are there people who get the joke, as it were? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity uh, uh, over the, the past year, especially when, uh, last summer when I was doing my uh, killer book tour, uh, to meet a number of our uh, of our listeners. And they are fun people. Yeah. Wacky sense of humor. And, and mind you, mind you, that's our, our listeners and, and, and patrons and so forth. Uh, every show has a similar thing, somewhat different. Yeah. But, you know, the the typical, the way I look at it, a typical listener would be comfortable in a in an old pub or a, uh, a real or faux colonial-style tavern or a, um, you know, a, a dark wood and red leather banquet restaurant with uh, steaks, seafood, and uh, cocktails on the neon side outside. Yeah. Uh, and a wide range of conversation inside, and copious amounts of life giving waters, healing waters, as you might say. Uh, and I'm I'm going to try to connect this full circle why this matters too, not just like for your own contentment and happiness, but why it matters for the faith. Because I feel like that being like that is the shining city on the hill, and it's not necessarily about making a point in some hotly contested uh, debate, it's uh, through actions of charity uh, in getting getting people to like you and then respect your opinion and then being ready for... Being ready for you to come in for the kill. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, uh, Andrew from, from New Jersey is a really nice guy. I, I really respect him. He's a funny guy. He's well thought out. He's intellectual. 
um, oh, he goes to the Latin Mass or he's Catholic. Whoa, maybe I'll consider it now. See, and like, so like that could happen without even making a point, a proper point. And it, um, and it does. It does. I mean, if you examine convert stories, so often it's because of people they knew initially. Right. And on top of that, I, I keep getting hit with this too, where people tell me something that I've said to them that like made a huge difference, and I didn't even remember the conversation. <laughs> so it's like that thing, and I'm sure a lot of other people experience. I know you've experienced this, Charles, where it's not when you're making a proper, super important point that you, the big. Uh, the big changes made in someone else. It's this innocuous, seemingly innocuous point or this seeming innocuous encounter. And then it totally is, turns into this other thing. Yeah. And also very, very often you'll make some off comment that, how do I put it? It's sort of a catalyst for wherever they were already. You don't think it's, it's something you might say a million times a day. You don't, you don't even think twice about it. Uh, and, but for whatever reason, usually depending on where they were, it makes a point. Yeah. You know, how often has someone said to you, you know, I really needed to hear that. And you're like, well, that's great. Because <laughs> you're, you're not quite sure what it was that you can't know what's going on in their heads. You're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, whenever someone has said that to me, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've nodded and smiled, but to be honest with you, I've never, I've, I'm smart enough to know that there's another drama going on in their heads that I'm completely unaware of, hmm. and I play a role in that drama, but I don't know what that role is. You see what I mean? And that's true of all of us. I mean, it's not, not just me. We we are in each other's lives, but we really don't know the role we play in those lives. We think we do, but we don't. Uh, and sometimes you'll find out people think much better of you or much worse of you than you had any idea. And when you find out the reasons, you, you'll be left speechless. You know? Uh you know, the thing I've always liked about you is that I knew that if if I ever needed a cat, you'd, you'd buy me one. <laughs> I'm using a ridiculous example, of course, but... I think like, I get what? it, though. Yeah. It's yeah, just... yeah. Really? That That's... Oh, yeah. Man, I tell you something. I know... That if I was ever stuck in some dump of an apartment with mice all over the place, you'd just step up and get me a kitten. I know you would, because you're you're that kind of guy. <laughs> and then you know you're kind of wondering what kind of guy that is. <laughs> right. But we each play roles in each other's internal dramas, and as I say, sometimes somebody will. will you get a glimpse, and it's like, wow, I had no idea. And I, I mean, it's usually not that grotesque, but it's it's often very far from what you would think they thought about you. Yeah. That's interesting. I haven't gotten the, the that experience yet. I always have thought that I knew, as you say, but I guess I don't know at all. Well, you, you can't. You, you can't know. Because you can't know the drama that's going on in somebody else's head. Yeah. And it's just as complex as the one going on in yours. And it's alien to you. So, I mean, I, I've, I've had people I went to school with tell me things about myself, the light they saw me in. And I was like, what? Really? I mean, okay. And when... I guess I've expressed a sort of incomprehension. You get the response, you really have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. 
and then I'd be informed. I said, oh, well, okay. And then I could see it from their point of view. I still didn't see it, but I could see why they saw it. I see. Oh, okay. Because I'm, none of these things pop out of nowhere. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, I, I always thought that probably your hair was blue and you just tint it. No. That's not going to happen. It won't come out of nowhere. Mm. Unless your hair was blue and you did tint it. What was it? <sighs> Is your hair really blue? No, it's not. So you're not tinting it? I'm not tinting it. That's your real... What? Color. This the hair is... color I see, the black, that's your real color. Yes. Okay. It's not blue. It's not blue, Charles. That's All dispelled. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I've got nothing against blue hair. I mean, on Mars, you'd see it all the time. It could be quite becoming. So, I mean, if that's your real color, it's all right by me. All right. Good. I'm glad you're uh, accepting. Oh, I, 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 look, look at the company that employs me. <laughs> if I can't be more accepting by employers, I'm really in a bad way. That's true. All right. So, thank you for that question, Jeffrey. That's, uh, that's a really important question you asked. All right. Uh question from Daniel who says dear uh, dear Vincent and Charles first of all having introduced myself previously as a groundskeeper at Antietam Battlefield I feel the need to assure Mr. Frankini that while my job here is what puts food on the table my position on the custodial crew of Tumblr House is where my heart truly lies and if you'd finally come good on that raise you've been dangling over my head for years then I'd finally be able to quit this second job and spend more time with my wife and soon-to-be-born child. But I digress. Now, oh. See, there's the subtle hint. So, okay, so this is a perfect example of someone who has not built rapport that is coming on a little too strong <laughs> and needs to sort of listen more. You know, I just, that, that the entitlement, right? Like, oh, entitlement. what's in it for me? Oh, the guy's I... working himself to the bone for two jobs to support his wife and seven children. And, you know, you won't give him a raise. You just you just dangle it in front of him. Dangle it? He hasn't earned yeah. it. This is a meritocracy, as I've always said. You see my finger? Uh, my thumb <laughs> <and four> finger? <laughs> I've seen you do it with other people. I've seen you do it with me. I know how you dangle raises. Well, well it, it motivates it, people, does it not? To do more. It doesn't motivate me. Well, why? Maybe that's a character defect. <laughs> <laughs> if you... <laughs> what? Then I won't let myself be be motivated by a raise I'm not going to get anyway. <laughs> I I don't think that's a character defect. <laughs> I think it shows I'm not a moron. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't call it a character defect. No, I, I think if you gave this guy the promised raise, uh, he could support his, uh, his uh, 12 children and uh, his wife, you know, in, in, uh, and he wouldn't have to work in Antietam Battlefield anymore. He could work all the time at the Tumblr House Tower. Well, that's but, a, okay. And in any case, you know, you can see he's really tried to suck up to you. You notice he got you that Confederate monument from the battlefield and installed it. That's true. Okay, Daniel. Um, we'll we'll see how he goes in the uh, in your biannual review. But um, tell him you'll take it under consideration. I'll take that it always, under serious consideration. Yeah. That always fobs people off for six months. <laughs> All right. Um, no, seriously though, uh, congratulations on your soon-to-be-born child. That's really yeah, awesome. number number fifteen. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but okay. Um, well, you notice that his the numbers of his children keep going up with every pitch I make for him. <laughs> it was seven, then it was twelve, now it's fifteen, 
And I think you really should pay the amount of money necessary for him to support the 23 children he's got there. Wow. All right. So his question is, uh, he says, my question for Charles concerns the Father Baptist books. Having uh, watched Off the Menu for years and finally having read all of the Father Baptist books, it is quite clear to me which of the tumblers in the books was based on him. Please ask Charles how closely the fictional character in the books correspond to a 20 or 30 something year old Charles and to explain any of the major differences between their two personalities. Well, I'm much more reserved in the book than I was in real life. I think that's actually true. Well, you've served. I don't know. You're pretty crazy IRL. <laughs> I, I don't it, that's a tough you, you know yourself? you know it's been a while I need to reread the the Father Baptist series uh it's been a, like 10 years but um I'm well, sure they haven't changed <laughs> No I mean I don't remember I don't remember the character well, it's I would say actually it's pretty pretty similar I mean you know the thing is that uh each of the group that the Tumblars were based on, uh, they're pretty much the way they were in, in the book. I don't think he, uh, I feel like he doesn't straight up crack jokes and tell stories as much as you do in conversation. Uh, yeah, that, we'll see if he did, he'd be the center of attention. And he's, he's a... Uh, <laughs> That's true. You, you can't know, do that. If, if, if the character was constantly pulling the kind of drivel that I do, you know, it would be about him, which is not, not what it's about. I see. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose it's, uh, I suppose it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good rendition of the way I was back then. Uh, now, of course, I'm much more, uh, sedate and, uh, uh, serious and, uh, all that other garbage. <laughs> <laughs> All that other garbage people pretend they think is important. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, uh, I don't have the energy I had then. Uh, and my hair is white. <laughs> but other than that, I don't suppose I've changed all that much. When you say energy, does that mean in, like simply like going out and doing things? Like, yeah. 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 Okay. I, uh, you know, I, in those days, when I was that age, uh, the idea of staying staying home in an evening or going out, there was just no question I'd go out, you know. Then, But as time goes by, they become equally enjoyable. So whether you go out or you stay in, you can't lose. Uh, and then you get to the time when staying in is actually preferable. I mean, you'll go out. Uh, and I and I I do go out, but uh, it's 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 pleasant being able to stay home and uh, put your feet up. That's interesting relax. coming from you. I mean, I consider you still so incredibly active. Uh, well, I, and I, and I am, I guess, especially for compared to my peers. Uh, but. You know, I, I, I'm definitely not the uh, not the social maniac I was when I was younger. I mean, I just don't have the energy. Okay. Uh, in those days, I mean, I can remember, especially when I was in my 20s, uh, I thought nothing of going to three parties in the same evening, you know, and, and making an appearance and... Uh, uh, and shoving off. I, I had an interesting experience uh, the past couple of years, maybe two years ago, because uh, I was back in LA. And I uh, I talked to a kid who was not a kid anymore, an old friend of mine now, I can say, but when I first started, he was a kid. Uh, and I took him to his first Hollywood party. Uh and he, uh, he, I, I had forgotten the incident completely, but he uh, recounted to me how I had, 
at one point during the evening, I collect, I basically collected him up and said, we're going now. And he said, why? I said, well, there are reasons. We're leaving right now. And we left. And I can, I can guess why I would have done that. It would, it would either have had to do with, with drugs or sex or something. You know, if I, if I thought that the party was going in a direction I didn't, uh, A, I didn't want to be with myself, and B, wouldn't want him exposed to, then I would have, I would have taken him out. Um, but as I said, I didn't remember the, the thing. Anyway, he said, we got out of there, and you said something to me I have never forgotten. And I looked at him, and I said, oh, what's that? You, you looked me in the eye, and you said you were really plastered out of your gourd, but it it didn't affect your, your, your manner. And you said, remember, kid, you don't have to shoot up, and you don't have to put out. I've never forgotten that, he said. And I, I as I say, I, it sounds like something I'd say. I don't remember it, but it, it sounds like something I would have said. Because that's the, that's the sort of advice I'd always give uh, newcomers to the big nowhere. You don't have to shoot up and you don't have to put out. Hmm. And in later years, what did I find? Well, I, I think I've mentioned on the show before, Tequila Mockingbird and I had that rather ominous lunch after a couple of people we knew, brother and sister, had died. And we totaled up the people that we'd known in common in those days. And almost all of them are dead either AIDS or heroin. So way back then, I knew that uh, neither putting out nor um, shooting up were good moves. And I can well imagine that I would have said just that to any newcomer that came across my path. Hmm. It was a tough place to grow up. You know, I, I, I can't pretend it wasn't. Uh, I thank God for the parents I had. I thank God for the faith. I thank God for everything. Because it would have been so easy for me not to be here. Mm. But I am. So there it is. All right. Uh, a question from Vonday Radio. Ah. Actually says, Dear Vinny and Charles. So long as you are not bound by Omerta, please, can you expound on the illustrious history of the Knights Tumblr? Wow. Go you ahead, know, Charles. Well, when you speak of Omerta, I think of your great uncle. He yeah. said to me, remember, kid, Omerta. And I said, uh, I don't really understand what that means, Uncle Giovanni. And he said, for you people, it's la code de silence. And that I understood. La code de silence, the code of silence. But there wasn't one covering the society that was inspired the uh, Knights Tumblr, so I can tell you all about it. Basically, um, And in the 80s of the last century. <laughs> I love that line. I used to read it in old novels in the 20s when I was a kid. And I knew I'd be able to use it one day. Wait, what when line? I was, when I was a young man in the 80s of the last century. Wow. Well, you know, novels written in the 20s, there was always this old guy saying that. Okay. And now it's the 2020s, and I can say it. But I knew in the 1970s, as a teenager, reading books written in the 1920s, that one day I would be able to use that same line. And now I can. So there. Beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. What goes around comes around. (laughs) Don't ask me how that applies. I don't know. And why should I? No, but uh, basically... Uh, the Knights Tumblr were based upon uh, a group called, in, em- in emulation of P.G. Woodhouse, the Drones. And the the very first drones were Kirk Mulhern, Mike Dykes, and myself. In the 80s of the last century, 
uh, after Latin Mass in San Fernando Mission. So it started there. We go to the fabulous Presidente restaurant for their Sunday brunch and drink copious amounts of champagne and sing songs. And that was the start of the drones. And uh, other people joined, your brother being one. And gradually we, we started wearing uh, evening dress when we go out at, uh, in the evening, white tie or black tie. Uh, and we'd get into all sorts of conversations about theology and everything else. But the fun part was when someone would be stupid enough to say, who are you people? Why are you dressed that way? Because then, whoever said it was meat for the grinder. And whoever answered would come up with some crazy response, and all the rest of us would support him until the offending individual was driven out of their minds. And I, we, we had all, all sorts of, of answers. We're professional mourners. You know, we've just come from a funeral. Who died? Oh, we don't we, we didn't know him. We were hired to mourn him, that's all. We we never met the man. What? No, we, we, it's what we do. We, it's, we, we hire out to mourn for, you know, people that don't have anyone else to mourn for. I mean, let's say that you, you're you living in New York. You can't be bothered to come out. Your Aunt Sadie's uh, popped it. You're, 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 you're enough into her to pay for the funeral. But you're not going to be bothered with coming out. And even if you were, you don't know her, her people from Adam. You hire us to mourn. And we'll fill out the seats at the funeral and all that. And we'll eat the food and, all, and pretend that we're very upset. You know, and it'll impress the, uh, the, the minister or whatever you've got going. You know. Yeah. That I, was one. Yeah, yeah. We. I know the other one. The the Queen Anne and uh, the, the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary, excuse me, and the Guard Tower one are the big ones. Yeah, the Guard Tower, and there was the the fabulous uh, uh, Northwoods Inn Putch. What is that one? Well, the uh, it so happened that we were at uh, we were at the long, the Northwoods Inn in Long Beach. And our one of our songs that we would sing as a group was Springtime for Hitler oh. from the producers. Well, the rest of the guys, I won't say, I won't mention whether or not your brother was there, but the rest of the guys, we all had quite a good deal to drink. The rest of the guys wanted to sing the song. And I didn't think this was a wise idea. And they were there with the, with the pianist, you see, the piano bar. And I said, well, probably the, the pianist doesn't know it. And he says, oh, I know it. Sure, spring time for Hitler. I can do that. And I thought, well, I don't know. Oh, come on. I said, all right. So I succumbed to peer pressure. We sing it. And the audience gets into it. Yeah. It was the first time in my life I was afraid of an audience because they liked me. Wow. Yeah. So ever after that went down in our history is the the, the uh, Northwoods Inn Putsch. It was surreal. I mean, the, the, the audience was just, yeah. All right. I, 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 as I say, this is the, the only time in my life I've ever been afraid of an audience because they liked me. Whew. But we had a lot of, a lot of, evenings and i remember i remember them all very very fondly no uh, but time marched on people got married had kids and mm. uh, i alone am left to sing their deeds and praise them when i can those boys of balustrada who hunted for the rem hmm uh, how's it go? With cudgel stout, we'd walk about and hunt the small dohi. Anyway, it ends. Uh, but now they flit in foreign soil, 
the lads that laughed with me. Down in the heart of London town, over on Broadway. I alone am left to sing their deeds. Those boys of Balistrada who hunted for the ram. Yeah, the, the um, great times, great times. I'll never forget them. And they have been immortalized and somewhat, uh, but only slightly romanticized uh, by Bill Beersack in the Father Baptist series. So if you want to find out a little bit what I was like when I was younger, order the Father Baptist series and you can know. Of course, I should also point out that while you're doing that, you might want to pick up my Star Spangled Crown. That's right. All right. Uh, we are out of time for this episode. Um, you can't mean that. You can't uh, be serious. I do. I'm sorry, Charles. Oh, squeeze out one last question. One last question? Okay. I'll squeeze out one last question. All right. Here we go. Are you ready for the question? I are. Would Charles t please talk about the medieval Catholic kings of Scotland and more specifically the Stuarts? What were some Catholic traditions that were unique to Scotland, and why did the Protestants gain such a foothold there? So let me guess. This is going to be a 45-minute answer? No. All not right. with you in this kind of a mood. <laughs> yeah. Of course not. You think I don't know not to bite uh, the head of feet? I don't care about the Scottish Charles. I, no, wow. It's actually, sorry, Ross. I, I, I don't want – Ross is going to hand me That's Ross my head. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, oh, man. Oh. Somebody's on the short list. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Well, firstly, Ross, I want to apologize for my wayward employer. He's obviously had a little too much Dago Red this evening. But it's okay. It's all right. I had lasagna for lunch, by the way. Great. I want you to know this. Yes. Austrian lasagna. Made with big chunks of pork. So at, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, well, the Stuarts are originally a Norman French family and were established in Scotland uh, thanks to St. Margaret and her civilizing mission. Um, they became the uh, stewards of Scotland to the kings. Uh, but when the lines of the king fa of the kings failed, a la Gondor, uh, unlike Gondor, they became kings themselves. This was in the, the wake of uh, Robert the Bruce's grandson, I think. Uh, Robert the Fourth, Stuart, son of Walter the Stuart, I think is correct, uh, became king. Now, the Stuarts have a lot of different branches. The royal Stuarts, of course, became kings of Scotland. But they're the Stuarts of Appen, the Stuarts of Argyll, the Stuarts of this, the Stuarts of that. They're all over, all related, however. Um, and apart from the royal family, the Earl of Galloway is the senior Stuart of all the different branches and parts of the clan. Uh, after James I, all the kings of Scotland down to Charles I were called James. James I, James II, James III, James IV, James V. And then he had a daughter, Mary Queen of Scots. Her story, you'll remember. Uh, her son was James VI, the first of England. His son was Charles I of England and Scotland. His sons were Charles II and Charles the Seventh of Scotland and Second of England. His son was James the Eighth of Scotland and the Third of England. And then uh, his sons were uh, Charles the Third and Henry the Ninth. All right. Um, one of the problems with the latter uh, Stuart kings. I think from James the Third, is that they all died young. And the reason why this was a problem was that they left infants behind them as kings. And this meant regencies that went on for quite a while. 
and things are always much more difficult under a regency than with a reigning king. Uh, there's never was this more disastrous than with the death of Mary Queen of Scots' father, James V, uh, because his queen was French, and she didn't really have that much of a power base in the country. And that was one reason why the Reformation so-called succeeded was that Mary of Guise did not have that much of a power base, but she did what she could. And then when her infant daughter grew up and came back, she got out of Dodge. She'd had enough of trying to keep Scotland on an even keel. Um, the one reason why the Reformation did so well in Scotland was as it did well in other Protestant countries. Uh, it allowed the local lords to grab the church lands, and boy did they ever. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't all an easier done thing. As far as the traditions of the Scots kings, the earliest of them were buried at Iona, which is an island in the Hebrides. And interestingly enough, my uh, McKinnon ancestors were the family that usually provided the abbots of Iona. A lot of Scottish kings buried there. But eventually, they started burying them near uh, near Edinburgh in a place called Dunfermline Abbey. And the palace at Dunfermline became a big residence for the Scottish king. The Scots kings were anointed with chrism, like the kings of England and the kings of France, rather than the oil of catechumens. Moreover, when they were crowned, moreover, they were crowned not in Edinburgh, not in Perth, but in a town called Schoon. And there they were placed upon a stone, the Lea Fall, the Stone of Destiny, which supposedly had been brought over from Ireland, where it had been the uh, crowning stone of the High King Zatara. It became the, uh, the coronation stone of the kings of Scotland. Edward I brought it back down to England and put it in the coronation chair when he claimed to be King of Scots. And they never got it back until John Major brought it back from London and put it back in Edinburgh, where it is now. Um, the last person to be crowned King of Scots was Charles II. And uh, let me see. Well, of course, as with England, uh, Scotland had a lot of abbeys, many of which were royal. And all, all in all, um, Scotland's universities were Catholic foundations, St. Andrews and Aberdeen and Edinburgh. Um, so, so much of what Scots think of as Presbyterian originated with the Catholic Church. Not the Calvinism, of course, but uh, various uh, customs and legal things and so on. Anyway, so that'll have to do it. Uh, the Highlands stayed Catholic longer than the rest of the country. And to this day, there are districts, places like the NZ and the and parts of the Outer Hebrides that are still all Catholic. Uh, yeah, that'll about do it. All right. That will do it for this episode, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I feel like it was very substantial, and very fun too. Um, well, I I don't know because, see, I'm coming from a place of great. I mean, it's just because, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. For sure. <laughs> and I, I and I, I just because, and I mean, because you look at it, and then it's just because, and I mean, I just, I mean, I. You, it's just you, you know what i'm saying totally for sure <laughs> well i got a question for you yeah what is it if it's off the menu that would mean it's monday huh <laughs> and what about your own soul you could save it sounds good <laughs> <laughs> 